is Ben Schwellen. Today I'm talking about the four types of languages. What are they? Hey, hit that subscribe button. It really helps the channel. Thank you so much. There are only four types of languages. You have gluing languages, agglutinative, analytic languages, which are isolators. You have fusional languages, which are like between the two on a spectrum. And you have polysynthetic languages, shapeshifters. Today I'm talking about fusional languages. If you are thinking of learning a language or you're interested in languages and you don't know which language quite to learn, it helps to understand which languages are closer to your language in terms of how they work, even if they're unrelated to each other. There are only four types. So what are some fusional languages? Welsh, French, most of the Indo-European languages that are not Scandinavian or English. Navajo, like I mentioned, is a, a fusional language which is quite different from how a lot of Native American American languages work because it conjugates the verb in a way that's a bit different. And Semitic languages like Hebrew or Arabic are fusional. The most part of fusional languages are Indo-European. Indo-European has spread across the world through French, Spanish, Greek, Russian, Hindi, Bengali, Lithuanian and Latvian, German, Italian. All these are fusional languages, Romanian, Persian, though Persian has taken on a lot of agglutinative influences. Pashto is fusional as well. Icelandic, Irish, all the Celtic languages. So because of the Indo-European family, chiefly fusional is a deep impact upon the world. So what are these fusional languages? What are the characteristics of this? So they have a few words that go into slots, like the little boxes I showed you in English or Chinese, but they conjugate verbs. What do I mean by that? So the one I'm most familiar with is Welsh. So the verb comes first in Welsh, but you fuse it with who is doing it. So tavluni, I would throw. Tavlai, I will throw. Tavlai si. I threw, and this goes down through all the different people who are doing it. Tabloni, we would throw. English does do this in some very, very set circumstances. He sees the goat. That S at the end is a conjugation. It shows you that he's doing it. You don't need the he in a way. But, but by and large, English is not fusional. Though all languages are on a spectrum, one reason why I wanted to show you Welsh first or talk about Welsh first is because it's more toward the analytic side of the spectrum. If you look at older Welsh, we have a lot more gluing type thing going on towards the agglutinative spectrum on the other end. But that's been lost a bit over the centuries. We are starting to put a lot of smaller words between words, which isn't quite very Welsh. Let me give you this example. You can say, Busha Prividhinas Cymru. And that makes perfect sense. But a lot of people now would put that the E, which is the letter I, it means four, two, in there to convey who owns it, which is analytic. That, that's a borrowing of syntax from English. It's not Welsh. So, busha E, brivdi nas Cymru. Bus is four. Wales is capital city. But in Welsh, because you have the word order as it is, you don't need that. It's already implied. And that's more of a fusional aspect. Russian has a lot of this as well, in terms of dropping out the smaller words. And there's something called the zero copula, which is... sentences or phrases without the verb to be. So in Russia, you can say sobaka doma. And this literally means dog home. You don't need any of the other small words. You don't need to say the dog is at home. There's no the, and there's no is, and there's no at. You just know 
from where they are in the sentence. And that's something that a lot of fusional languages do that analytic languages like English or Swedish or Chinese just don't do because they need those spatial awareness words. Those tiny words are a lot to do with space and where things are in relation to what and to who. And that's a big determinant of all these types of languages, how they conduct the meaning of space and location between objects and subjects and people and things. One of the traits that is unique to many of these fusional languages, though not entirely f just fusional, are consonant mutations or consonantal mutation. What is that? Basically, a letter like G can harden into a C sound or B can soften into a V sound, depending on the grammar in a sentence and what things mean. It changes the meaning in many cases. So Welsh and all the Celtic languages have this. Consonantal mutations are quite unique and I, I like that this happens in Welsh. It's something that denotes, well, possession, um, kind of almost grammatical case in a way, but Welsh doesn't have grammatical cases. It shows where things are in relation to who. A lot of that spatial awareness coming back again in this tense. Let's show you what I mean by that. So the word for house is T. And the word for old is hen. Hen is one of these unusual ones that comes before the noun it's describing in Welsh, usually. So you would write hen D. That T becomes a D. And that's really, it's one of the things that makes Welsh unique. You have this in Russian as well, in a different way. In Russian, consonants change according to the quantity or the intensity in many cases. Take loud. Louder. Gromke. Gromshe. Gromke. Gromshe. There's a, there's a mutation there from k -tish. There's a change in the consonant in the middle of the word. It's not at the beginning like in Welsh. It changes from language to language what these mutations are. In Russian, it accentuates the fact that the quantity or the intensity of something has changed rather than in Welsh to do with the location of who it is or what it is. And look at this map of the consonant mutations in these languages. And this shows all the languages with consonantal mutations. You'll notice something really unique about this. Where the consonantal mutations are, or where different areas of these four groups of languages have rubbed up against each other. So you have the Celtic languages which have been rubbing up against the analytical language of English and the Scandinavians for a long time. And before this period, they were even agglutinative or more agglutinative. And the mutation in Welsh was a way of keeping some elements of that agglutinization without gluing words together. In Africa, you have this little strip here. And this is unique because what you have is almost a dividing line of where the mutations are in these languages according to what south of it are analytical languages and to the northeast of it are Semitic language, Arabic, which is fusional, and to the northwest you have an agglutinative family of Berbers. And this line is where they all collide with each other. And that's interesting as well. And Russian and the Slavic languages, they're the ones that are most under the influence of the finno Greek family. Agglutinative languages. It seems to me that this left an influence on these languages, some type of marker. Because it's not just something that happens in fusional languages. You have this in Southeast Asia as well in Indonesia, where there's a lot of cross influence between different kinds of language. Analytic languages convey with a lot of tiny words. Fusional languages do it more by conjugating verbs and where they are in the sentence. The structure of the sentence themselves are much more fluid than say English or Chinese. French is a fusional language. Let me show you a bit of conjugation for that. In terms of the word to go, is quite different 
it, it changes entirely. It's not just like in English, he sees or to see. Many verbs change entirely. French is a great language to show you what fusional languages are. There are so many things I could explain to you about French, but let's take the verb to go. Allez. Now, this form here is going to become completely different as it progresses through who is doing what, who is going, and when they went. And you'll notice that to go and went, that's different. And that's why English in many cases is not purely analytic. It's on a spectrum. All languages are on a spectrum, no matter which part of the four groups of languages they're in. So, you went to LA. But if you are going, that becomes tu va. That's a big change. I am going, je vais. Y'all are going, vous allez. And if it's conditional, she would go, elle ira. She will go, elle ira. And if he or she, il va, he goes, elle va, she goes. So you see that there's different inflections of this verb in ways that's more gluing than just the you went and you go. And it changes the pronoun part, the I, you, he, she, which is a fusional trait of all fusional languages that I've come across. Hebrew is a fusional language, but modern Hebrew is much more analytic than classical Hebrew was. It, however, had, does have something in common with Welsh that's very specific to fusional languages, and it's quite an agglutinative feature in a way. So different parts of different languages are on different parts of the spectrum. What is that feature? That's that prepositions can conjugate. What do I mean by that? Let me show you. Something that's truly unique about the Welsh language is that it conjugates prepositions. What are prepositions? Sorry about this fancy grammar speak. Prepositions merely mean a connector word. With, by, for, to. Words that connect longer words and the different positions of grammar in the sentence. That's all they are. So let's take one for or at. In Welsh, for and at are sort of the same word. It's e, which is the letter i. And if it's to you or for you, et. Well, I assume more of you are watching this than just one. Ichi. There's a difference between y'all and you in Welsh. If it's for her, ev. For him, either. For them, either no or event. If you're being a bit formal. For us, either ni. And Hebrew works the same way. Not exactly, but it conjugates prepositions in this way. Let me show you what happens in Hebrew. Leyad means near or next to. So they separate these conjugations in a way that's slightly different to Welsh. Near or next to you, masculine. Leadcha. Near or next to you, feminine. Leadech. So you differentiate between the male and the female in terms of the conjugation in a way that you wouldn't in Welsh, because in Welsh, if you say to you, et, there's no differentiation between gender there. So back to the Hebrew. Next to or nearby him, leado. Nearby her, leada. Nearby us, leadano. You get the idea. Here's just one more that I like. So with is im. But with me, et. So if you speak Welsh, you've got our heads into Hebrew. Fusional languages tend to conjugate verbs. And Hebrew, though it has shifted more towards analytic, does have this available. So in Hebrew, you have a different conjugation than the one I showed you with French. You have what's kind of like, imagine like a pyramid and you have locked 
stone doors that come down into place as like keys almost. So look at the word a fish is dog in Hebrew. To conjugate it and to turn it into a fishing or your fishing, you still have that DG in there. So for we will fish, nadug. You will fish, tadug. You fished in the past, dog ta. So that those two keys are there, the D and the G, and it just revolves around that according to set patterns. There's a change there. Things change according to who's doing what, when, to who. That's not analytic, that's fusional. And it's edging towards an, an agglutinative way of doing things. What's agglutinative? Before I get into that, I want to show you that it's a spectrum within the fusional type of language. Fusional languages are on a spectrum, and many of them are moving towards analytic, but some of them are moving towards being more agglutinative. The Armenian language is surrounded, not entirely, but flanked on multiple sides by languages which are agglutinative. So Armenian has Turkish, Azerbaijani, and Georgian on different sides, and these have influenced the language over time. So part of the syntax of this fusional language is more and more agglutinative. It's, it's changing in the way that Welsh is becoming more of an analytical language. Armenian, in many cases, is becoming more of an agglutinative language. Languages change, and they change between different categories of these four different types of language. Armenian, which is surrounded by Turkic languages, mostly, and Georgian to the north, which is a different family, but it is agglutinative. And this has had a deep impact upon the structure of the Armenian language. It's become more agglutinative. Many of these traits have seeped into the language and fossilized as being just a part of what the Armenian language is. So how is Armenian sometimes agglutinative? One more example. So, not agreed upon, just that phrase. What is that in Armenian? Chehamed Zainetz Vats. Let me break this up for you bit by bit so you see how agglutinative here is different from the fusional ones I've just shown you. The ch at the beginning is a negation. Negation is just a fancy word meaning it makes it no or not, it, it says no. Hamad Zain is to agree, without a tense to it really. Etz is the causative. Causative just basically means that it's being done. That's it. What's being done. I don't know why they use these long words. It's what's being done. Causative. The V here just means that it's passive. Passive just means that nobody who has done it is present. It's just been done. It's being done. And then at is a past participle. Participle is just a fancy word for a small bit and past. So literally what we have here is not agree, being caused or being acted upon passively without anyone present doing it in the past, not agreed upon. And these are a bunch of grammar bits fused together. This is not fusional. Which brings us to agglutinative languages is next. Stick around. Hey, Diochen Warum Willio, thank you very much for watching.